Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Community Church. We are a welcoming congregation where we strive to transform ourselves and the world through love, wonder, and connection. My name is Elena Brooks Perkins. I use she, her pronouns, and I serve on the worship committee. I sing in the choir, help with RE sometimes, <laughs> bake for the bake sale next week. <laughs> Whether you're here for the first time or the thousand, thousandth time, welcome. Whatever you are facing in your own life, welcome. This is a place where we try our best to be real with each other, to get through hard things together, and to remind ourselves and one another that the values that ground and center us, motivate and move us. Whomever you are, whatever your faith journey, whomever you love, you are welcome here. We welcome all who seek to know the sacred and all who seek to make our world more just. Our commitment is to be together in covenant, to live out our values, and to work together towards our mission. These are what make a church. These are what make our church. Please rise in body or in spirit to join me in our affirmation of who this community is beginning with that all-important word. Love is the message of this church, and service is our way. This is our great covenant together, to grow together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. Please sit down. <laughs> and I invite Susan Wood up to make an announcement. Good morning, it's so good to see you all. <laughs> I'm Susan Wood and I use she, her pronouns and I am so glad to see here, to be here. I'm speaking to you today though on behalf of the nominating committee. I joined UUCC in 2017 and I also serve on several other co committees you know, in some capacity, because I felt called and still do to support the values and beliefs of UUism and of this church, it's very dear to me. Several weeks ago, I was given the opportunity to examine my own relationship with this church. I was asked to explore if one of my own love languages was acts of service. I'd never thought about this before, never labeled it, Thinking back, I've served as a volunteer in many leadership positions throughout a lifetime of service, both professionally and, and um, as a volunteer. With each position, I felt a passion or calling to programs that help make a positive impact in this community or the, in the community as a whole. I've always tried to let myself be, be guided by my values and beliefs. I know I feel energy and enthusiasm for programs whose missions I believe in too. I know I gravitate towards leadership positions because I like being part of the bigger picture, seeing how all the pieces fit together. Leadership positions give me a voice and an opportunity to contribute to support others and be their voice too. I really like people working together to figure out how to accomplish goals and challenges. So yes, acts of service has probably always been a love language for me. I communicate love through service. Do you find yourself draw, drawn to taking action in some, some way? Do you communicate love through acts of service? If so, please consider following the love languages and maybe consider a leadership position to support our community. We need you. If you feel called to explore how you can serve in one of the open leadership roles, please reach out to one of us on the nominating committee. We'll help you figure out where you might like to serve. 
Your talents and love for this community are valued. Let's talk. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. So now I invite you to rise again in body or in spirit to sing our opening hymn. We celebrate the web of life, number 175 in our gray hardback hymnal. witness these chalice lighting words while Elena lights our chalice. We light this chalice for the web of life which sustains us, for the sacred circle of life in which we have our being, for the earth, the sky above and below, and for our mother earth, and for the mystery. You may be seated. And now I invite you to find a comfortable place for your body as we join in prayer and meditation. Find that comfortable place. Move if you need to. Notice your breathing. Find your center. Allow yourself to be present here today. We hold in our hearts today, the people of the Middle East, escalating violence happening there. We hold in our hearts all those living with, struggling with, surviving depression, anxiety, addiction, We hold in our hearts all of those who care for those people as well, which is us. We hold in love, we hold in light the names that are in all of our hearts, each individual having more than some. I invite you now to speak those names into this silence. 
to share with us a cacophony of love. Amen. And now in our second week of doing our Centers of Connection, I will uh, give you even more introduction this week than last week, so look forward to that. Ritual, as we probably know and sometimes don't want to think about, is important to how each one of us lives our lives, be it having a meal together, be it brushing our teeth, be it whatever we do, coming to church on Sunday, we humans, we like to do things on repeat, over and over and over. And we like to light our candles in the service every, every week. And in this instance, I'm giving us two other opportunities of how to share your life with this community and make meaning together. So the first, we will continue to do our Joys and Sorrows candles. They're right here in the front, can't miss them. This is when you will light a candle to say, I'm holding a sorrow, like perhaps there's an illness in your family, or a joy, like maybe there's a new baby coming into your life, or something like that. And then we'll have stones of hope and of fear, where we can acknowledge the fears and hopes that are in our lives. Maybe fear about a big test coming up or a challenge at work. Or we might be holding hopes for the outcome of a new big life challenge. So we'll do stones for those. And then third, we'll do our tree of interdependence. So you'll get a leaf at the table, write on it, how you see we are interconnected, interdependent in this world. We'll attach the leaves to the tree as I did last over the week. You can see there are a few leaves on there now. We'll hopefully get more and more full as the month goes on and then we'll have a beautiful spring tree to bring us into May. So what you can put on these leaves are things like how you care for your animal friends or what it means to be part of a family or you can write about your favorite plant or a body of water. There's so many different ways that we're interdependent. So it can really be anything that moves you. So those are our three centers. We have candles here, stones there, leaves that side. So there are three ways you can interact with this. First, you can raise your hand with one of the numbers that I'll tell you about in a minute and someone will do the process for you so you may remain in your seat and still participate if you're on zoom you can um, interact with the chat box you can put the center you'd like to to interact with on there and scott will come and bring it forward for you and finally you can rise and move to whichever center you would like to participate in when you're ready you can even do all three if you're moved to do that there's plenty of time so First, raising hands, if you would like someone, yes, thank you, to light a candle for you, raise your hand with the number one. If you'd like someone to drop a stone for you, do number two. You can do both. And if you'd like someone to bring you a leaf to write on, raise your hand with a number three. Okay. I think we got everyone candle lit. So 
If you would like to rise and come to one of the centers on your own, you may do that. If you're coming to light a candle, come down this side of this front aisle and then return that way. If you're coming to do a stone, come down this side of this aisle to here. If you want to do a leaf, go down all the way to the side to the leaf. All right. Candles, stones, leaf. We will also light candles for Carolyn Sommer, John Countryman, and Nakia Lewis. We'll do one final candle for all the joys and sorrows that remain in our hearts unshared so that we know we are all holding them together. We'll also do one final stone of hope and sphere. Just to know we're holding all your hope and fear as well. And now We'll sing our song, our sung prayer response, There is a Love.
as Miss Adina has just returned from Puerto Rico, I am standing in for her, allowing her to have just a little breath before coming back to work. So I'll share this story. It's called Gecko. Of course, I don't remember who wrote it, but that's okay. It's on our um, worship web. You'll be able to find it if you're interested. In a shady glade, oh, and it's not in your order of service either. I changed it, just so you, if you were looking. In a shady glade, the chief of the jungle slept until gecko, gecko, gecko. Tiger woke up with a snort. He opened one yellow eye. Gecko, he growled, what do you want? It's the middle of the night. I've come to complain, said the gecko. What could Gecko the lizard have to complain about? He spent most of his time lazing around, sleeping and eating. Even when he was hungry, all he had to do was flick out his sticky tongue and lick up a mosquito. What's troubling you, Tiger asked. It's the fireflies, said Gecko. All night long they fly around, flashing their lights in my eyes, keeping me awake, flashing and flickering. I haven't slept for days. It's making me very grumpy. You're the chief of the jungle. Make them stop. Tiger stifled a gigantic yawn. I'll talk to the fireflies, he promised Gecko. Tiger sighed and set off to find the fireflies. Wading through wet paddy fields, the night vibrated with the chirps and croaks of frogs and the trills of a million insects. Above the paddies, the fireflies flickered and flashed. Fireflies, Tiger said, Gecko says you've been disturbing his sleep, flashing and flickering all night long. Is this true? Well, we do flash our, nights all, our lights all night, replied the fireflies, but we don't want to disturb anyone. We're just passing on Woodpecker's message. We heard him drumming out a warning. I see, said Tiger. Then I'll go talk to Woodpecker. At the edge of the paddies, Tiger found Woodpecker drumming against the coconut palm. Rat-a-tat, rat-a-tat, rat-a-tat. Woodpecker, Tiger went, oh, the fireflies say you have been rapping and tapping and tapping and rapping, drumming out a warning. Is this true? Of course, said Woodpecker, puffing up his feathers. I provide a great service. Clearly, my efforts are not appreciated. He looked down his beak, his long beak at Tiger. Beetle rose, rolls manure right across the path. I warn the jungle animals so that no one steps in it. Without my drumming, who knows what a mess you'd all be in. Oh, said Tiger. Well, that's, that's very helpful, thank you. Tiger licked his nose thoughtfully. I'll go speak to Beetle. It was easy to spot Beetle in the jungle path. In the moonlight, his back gleamed like polished metal. What is all this, Tiger said? Woodpecker says you're rolling a filthy mess all over the place. Yes, yes, can't stop, Beetle replied, rolling a ball of dung right up to the tiger's paw. Water buffalo drops piles of it all over the path. If I don't move it some away, there'll be muck everywhere. Excuse me, I need to move this. Lift your paw, please. Tiger lifted his paw and Beetle bustled on past. Okay, Tiger said, suppressing a sigh. Thank you, Beetle. I'll go talk to Buffalo. Tiger found Buffalo asleep in a pool of mud. Buffalo, Tiger roared. Beetle says you've been leaving your manure all over the path. Is this true? Yes, sir, said Buffalo, lowering his head. I leave manure all over the path every afternoon. I leave manure only to fill up the holes so that no one trips and falls. If I didn't, sir, someone could get hurt. I see, said Tiger. Well, that's very thoughtful of you, Buffalo. Tiger's tail twitched. He was beginning to lose patience with all this. 
<sighs> I'll go ahead and hear what rain has to say because the rain makes the holes. Tiger set off for Mount Agong at the highest peak on the island, the home of rain. Tiger climbed and climbed and climbed, climbed through the jungle, through the woodland and the scrub, and he climbed some more. At last, his claws clattered onto the smooth grass of the mountain peak. He stopped to catch his breath. <sighs> he looked down the mountain. The sun was just rising. Tiger stared. The jungle spread out for miles around, flamboyant with flowers, wild orchids, climbing lilies, trumpets of violet blue and starbursts of brilliant flame red. Tiger sniffed. He smelt jasmine, yang yang, fred penny. He swiveled his ears. He heard newborn streams trickling and tinkling. And below the jungle, on the green gold steps of the paddy fields, he could just make out the faint flicker and flash of the fireflies. <sighs> no need to ask why rain rains, Tiger smiled. He cooled his paws in a stream and watched for a while. He watched the water journey from mountain to sea, sustaining every living thing on its way, even the tiniest mosquito. Tiger plunged his muzzle into the clear, fresh water, and he drank. And then he began his long journey down the mountain, through the forest and the jungles, until he found Lizard once again. Well, Gecko demanded, did you talk to the fireflies? They're still flashing and flickering on and on. Did you tell them to stop? Gecko, said Tiger, he sat down on his haunches and spoke very slowly. Listen carefully. The fireflies pass, flash to pass on Woodpecker's warning. Woodpecker warns everyone not to step in the beetle's dung. Beetle clears up the excess dung left by buffalo. Buffalo leaves manure on the path to fill up the holes made by rain. Rain makes holes in the path as he creates streams and lakes and puddles. Puddles where mosquitoes live. Oh, said Gecko. Gecko, what do you eat? Mosquitoes, said Gecko. So, said Tiger. So, repeated Gecko slowly. Yes, if rain stopped raining. Yes, buffalo could stop filling holes. Uh-huh, and beetle could stop rolling dung. Yes, and woodpecker could stop drumming. Mm-hmm, and the flies would stop flashing. Mm-hmm, yes, Gecko, but I would have nothing to eat. Exactly, said Tiger. Gecko, everything in this world is connected. Go and live in peace with the fireflies. So Gecko stuck himself upside down underneath the branch of a tree, closed his eyes, and went to sleep. The fireflies flickered and flashed, and Tiger snored. The end. And now I invite our kids to go off to their classes with their leaders and all of us to sing our song to sing them out. join me in our offering and acknowledging all the ways we give to this church and this world. We give because this is our church and we value what it does for us, to us and through us, to our community and our world. May there be an offering to sustain and grow the life and mission of this church inside and outside our walls. May we give in hope and in love.
thank you for your offering and all the ways you give to the life and ministry with your time, talent, treasure, and trust. Together, our gifts allow us to expand and strengthen the tapestry of love, wonder, and connection that blesses this church and transforms our world. The reading this morning is from A Psalm for the Wild Built by Becky Chambers. It's set in a distant fictional future where humans have yet have had to restructure their whole world to be more ecologically sustainable, partly because the robots, who became sentient, decided to leave the humans who made, uh, who made them to their own devices, moving deep into the wilderness to explore life on their own terms. In this passage, Dex, a human, and Moscap, a robot, are visiting the ruins of a factory when they have this conversation. There's this famous idea that life is fundamentally at odds with itself. The example usually used in the, is the wild dogs in the shrublands. Do you know about this? I know there are wild dogs in the shrublands, but I don't know where you're headed, Moscap said, looking fascinated. Dex shut their eyes, dredging up dusty information. Way back in the day, people killed all the wild dogs in Blue Bank because they wanted to go fishing and hiking and whatever without getting mauled. Right, and that wrecked the ecosystem there. Specifically, the elk wrecked the ecosystem there. They ventured into places they hadn't before, and they ate everything. Shrubs, saplings, everything. Soon there was no ground cover, the soil was eroding, and it was messing up waterways, and all sorts of other species were thrown out of whack because of it. Huge mess. But if you think about it from the elk's perspective, this is the greatest thing that ever happened. The whole reason they never went to those fields be before is because they were afraid. They live under constant fear of a wild dog jumping out and eating them or their young at any moment. It's an awful way to live. It must have been such a relief to be free of predators, eat whatever the heck you wanted. But that was the exact opposite of what the ecosystem needed. The ecosystem required the elk to be afraid in order to stay in balance. But the elk didn't want to be afraid. Fear is miserable, as is pain, as is hunger. Every animal is hardwired to do absolutely anything to stop those feelings as fast as possible. We're all just trying to be comfortable, well-fed, and unafraid. It wasn't the elk's fault. The elk just wanted to relax. Dex nodded at the ruined factory. And the people who made places like this weren't at fault either, at least not at first. They just wanted to be comfortable. They wanted their children to live past the age of five. They wanted everything to stop being so dang hard. Any animal would do the same, and they'd do if given the chance. Just like the elk, just like the elk. Mothcap nodded slowly. So the paradox is that the ecosystem as a whole needs its participants to act with restraint in order to avoid collapse. But the participants themselves have no inbuilt mechanism to encourage such behavior, other than fear. Other than fear, which is feeling you want to avoid or stop at all costs. The hardware in Mothcap's head produced a steady hum. Yes, that's a mess, isn't it? It sure is. So what was done? You mean about the elk? Yes. They reintroduced wild dogs and everything balanced back out. What about the people who wanted to go hiking and fishing there? They don't, or if they do, they accept the risks just like the elk do. The robot continued to nod because the alternative outcome is scarier than the dogs. You're still relying on fear to keep things in check, pretty much.
Our reading from this morning, thank you, Elena, excellent job, is from an amazing short book by Becky Chambers, and it showed us the ways that our ecosystem is in delicate balance, one part intertwined with others in ways we haven't been able to predict. The account is the reading of this fictionalized time, but is actually based on what's happened in Yellowstone National Park. Beginning in the 1930s, the wolves in Yellowstone were killed off and the ecosystem started to get out of whack because the elk population began to damage the trees, the foliage, the grass, everything. And then once the wolves were reintroduced back into the ecosystem in 1995, it created a cascade effect, changing the elk's behavior and bringing the ecosystem back into alignment. We are tied together in an interdependent web of existence. Pull one thread and the whole thing starts to come apart. Kill too many wolves and the elk eat too much of the plant life in one place. Trees disappear, the soil erodes, the beavers have trouble making their dens, and the fish and birds and insects are all affected. We are all intertwined with nature and our own ecosystems. We often forget that our own behaviors change the behaviors of the animals and the plants around us. The entire book, A Psalm for the Wild Built, is a love letter, a hope for a future where folks have learned to live into ecological systems, leaving as little destruction in their wake as humanly possible. After the robots left humanity, people taught each other how to live into eco-friendly practices. They taught their children not to cause harm to nature and how to repurpose and reuse as much as possible. They built small, sustainable communities where their homes are made out of things like reused metal or mycelium bricks that biodegrade when the homes aren't used anymore. The people ha still have their certain comforts like computers and other wonderful things, but they use bicycles to get around mostly and solar power for power of their lives, water power, all kinds of power. It seems fabulously idealistic. People living in comfort, offering each other mutual care and doing only what gives them pleasure to do in service of their community. There's no such thing as money there. People have all their needs taken care of because the good of all is only possible if everyone is supported. Of course, this is all just the background for a wonderful story about sibling Dex, who's looking for their true place in the world, who comes across a robot, Mosscap, who's looking for the answer to the question, what do you need? For humanity as a whole, to answer the question, what do you need? It's really an impossible question. In the context of the book, our reading takes place while they're standing in the abandoned ruins of a factory, a factory where Moscap's ancestors were forced to labor for humanity, and they're reflecting on why they no longer have factories and industry, how humans are too afraid to repeat the mistakes that led them to where they are, where they were, near the brink of total destruction, to try to start the same processes over again. And there's something to that. Sometimes the only thing keeping the in ecosystem intact is fear. For the elk, it's fear of being eaten. For humans in the book, it's fear of destroying something that they need to survive. The only mechanisms we have to keep ourselves from taking too much or unsettling the balance of life is fear. And fear is such an awful thing. We're always trying to conquer our fears, to find ways to overcome our natural, natural instincts of fear. Fear, of course, is designed to protect us from harm, from danger, and maybe in some cases from ourselves. We want to overcome our fears, even going to the point 
of banishing or destroying the things that we fear most. And we don't see that our comfort can come from the cost of others' well-being, their thriving, and even their lives. We don't see that the destruction of things we are afraid of makes it possible to destroy our own thriving, well-being, and even our lives. Right now, I'm not sure we, and when I say we, I mean those of us who are privileged to live in the United States and other Western countries, I'm not sure that we are afraid enough. Our lives aren't immediately affected by climate change, and it's hard to imagine anything in the environment changing that much anytime soon, but it is. Or, I don't know, maybe we're too afraid. Maybe the fear is too real and we're afraid to face what will happen when our climate has shifted to such extremes that our planet isn't habitable for humans anymore. Maybe we're paralyzed with fear about the changing future. Maybe it's too big to imagine and so we don't imagine it. Maybe we're both too afraid and not afraid enough. That's me most days. We're living in a time when it's easy to focus on the day-by-day -day realities of our lives, the minutia of living, working, cleaning, feeding, sleeping, not enough of some and too much of others. My brain is often filled with trying to figure out how to make sure my family gets enough sleep. It is also very easy to focus on the ways that we are all struggling against the extractive system of capitalism that funnels money to the very top while corrupting our political systems towards totalitarianism. The world is falling apart, people. <sighs> Maybe we can't see the ways the systems, that particular system, is one of the main causes of climate change. We have too long allowed the corporations to extract the resources of the earth without enough restrictions because they're making our lives comfortable. We have turned our attention away from the causes of the coming climate disaster because it's easier and simpler to take what we want and ignore the consequences. Our children, their children, and grandchildren are the ones who will have to find a way to survive in a world that's inhospitable to them, or how to live without the level of comfort that we've been used to. They're the ones who will have to deal with the increasing natural disasters and decreased social stability. They're the ones who will have to figure out how to create the sustainability that is so beautiful in Psalm for the Wild Built. And yet, we aren't without responsibility. Young people like Greta Thunberg have told us time and again, time and again, that they cannot lead us into the changes that need to happen. They're not the ones with the power now. We're the ones who need to push to make important changes in how our governments react and legislate for re regulations of businesses to reduce their carbon emissions. We are the ones who need to practice sustainable ways of living and make them common and expected for our young people. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the ones who can make a difference now. If we wait for Greta and Gen Z to come into their full power and influence before making changes, it will be too late. The problem is that if the planet heats above one and a half degrees Celsius, there's a huge chance that we'll experience climate breakdown. I'm sure you all know this. If it heats above two degrees, then it's unlikely we'll be able to turn things around. The generally agreed upon timeline is less than six years to limit the damage to just 1.5 degrees. So we have to start keeping our descendants in mind when we make our decisions. The seventh generation is a value from the indigenous people, the Haudenosaunee people. Sorry, I have not learned how to pronounce that yet. I'm working on it. 
Um, this confederacy of peoples has been known as Iroquois, or people of the longhouse. It's one of their guiding values that they make decisions with the seventh generation in mind, both the seventh generation into the future and seven generations back of ancestors. What would we do differently if we were to take an account the people who will live 150 years from now? What would we do differently if we were in tune with our environment, aware of the web that we are a part of? What if we were willing to protect it from our own desire to be unafraid and comfortable? We know that individuals aren't going to save the world by changing their individual actions, choosing to use reusable silverware, recycling, limiting personal emissions by flying less, driving electric vehicles, Wonderful. Each individual making that decision makes an impact, but not a giant one. But if most people choose to make these decisions, if we use our solidarity and buying power to influence corporations into changing their practices, yes, we're making a difference. If we use our solidarity and power to demand our politicians make decisions based on what's best for everyone within the next seven generations, choosing to make laws that limit corporations' carbon footprints, trying to get us to zero net zero emissions by 2050, then we are making a difference. It's so simple in some ways, and yet we have a long way to go. In my neighborhood, we are the only ones who have recycling cans. Our county chose not to subsidize recycling, and so our neighbors decided not to pay extra to recycle. Uh, they decided to just have extra trash cans. Now, as we know, recycling is the least we can do to help the environment, the very least, the bottom of the pyramid of reduce, reuse, recycle, with recycling just down there because first we need to reduce the amount of trash we make reusing single plastic doing our best to reuse sorry refusing single plastic doing our best to reuse anything that would normally end up in a landfill and then when we can't fix it anymore when we can't continue to reuse it we recycle it to be made new our ancestors used to live this way, bringing their own bags to the grocery store not even that long ago, using ceramic and glass containers to hold their foods and drinks, reusing everything until it couldn't be reused anymore. So what will our descendants do in 150 years? What can we teach our children, their children, and grandchildren to do that will help maintain the stability of this amazing interdependent web of life of which we are just one little part. Maybe if we do it well, they could live in a future like the idyllic one from Psalm for the Wild Belt, fully in tune with nature and with each other. May it be so, and may we make it so. Amen. Amen. Jonathan will lead us in our hymn. You may rise and body our spirit to sing along. The lyrics will be on the screen. This is where we are called to be. 
if you do not want to hold hands, just hold your hands on your chest. When you go, remember that you are part of this interdependent web, and if we can, let us sustain it together. When you go, go in peace. Leave this place knowing that you are good and that you are loved. Blessed be. Take your dark and your light and your love from this place. Share them with the world and stay safe until we meet again. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you. Please enjoy coffee hour and conversation in the lobby. Thank you.